Okay, so this is the second part of the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, Version 3. Um, so, and I'm Saki Rahman, I'm narrating. This is the uh, lecture um, authored by Drs. Krieg and Hock. Uh, and again, I'm narrating this. In the first part, we talked mostly about um, graft properties, autografts, and a little bit about graft incorporation. This talk we're going to focus, this portion of the, the slide show, I'm going to focus mostly on bone graft substitutes. So um, the need for bone graft alternatives has led to the development of all kinds of bone graft substitutes. The good thing is they can avoid morbidity of autogenous graft harvest, like we talked about. Um, the mechanical properties vary, uh, and they'll get into that. Most have osteoconductive properties, and some type of grafts can have osteoinductive properties if they have uh, growth factors, for instance. Uh, bone graft substitutes uh, can act as an extender for autogenous graft. So if you have really large defects that um, you have limited uh, graft quantity with uh, autograft, then uh, an, a, a bone graft substitute can help. Um, multiple level spine fusion is another example. Um, it can also act as an enhancer or simply just to substitute or replace for autogenous graft. Um, here's just a list of some of the graft substitutes you may see. We'll talk about a few of them. Um, calcium phosphate, calcium sulfate, collagen-based matrices, DBMs, hydroxyapatite, uh, tricalcium phosphate, uh, and uh, osteoinductive proteins that are kind of like, kind of like a bone graft. The resorption rates vary widely. Uh, to some degree, they depend on the composition. So um, calcium sulfate, sulfate is one of them that uh, resorbs very quickly. And hydroxyapatite is very, very slow. And calcium phosphate is kind of somewhere in between. Um, and to some degree, this is also dependent on porosity and geometry. So within one type of composition, this may vary from commercial product to commercial product. Uh, because of uh, because of these two factors, for instance, mechanical properties vary widely, and uh, that's dependent on the composition. So, calcium phosphate cements have very high compressive strength. Um, can tell us bone compressive strength is actually relatively low, and many substitutes have compression strengths that are more similar to uh, can tell us bone, and uh, t many of them are really designed to be used with internal fixation. So here's some examples of calcium phosphate. Um, you may see them used, for instance, uh, to elevate. Here's this uh, depressed tibial plateau fracture. You can see this gets elevated. Then there's a large defect, and that's filled with the bone graft substitute here. These may be in a form of a paste. They can be injectable, as shown here. And again, calcium phosphates have very high compressive strength. Um, and you can arguably allow earlier weight bearing without as much fear for subsidence. Um, calcium sulfates are a nice osteoconductive void filler. They don't have the same compressive strength. Uh, they rapidly resorb. Um, they can be used as an autographed uh, extender. Um, and uh, here are some of the commercial product that you may see. Um, they can be made in beads as well. Uh, you may see some kits where you can make these beads. You can also add antibiotics to them. So if you want to make a uh, sort of resorbable antibiotic cement beads, you can use them. And uh, you can inject them sometimes if you're doing internal fixation to augment screw purchase, similar to calcium phosphates. Collagen-based matrices. So this is when you have, uh, for example, a bovine uh, collagen sponge. Uh, these are uh, matrices that you can add, uh, for instance, um, uh, bone marrow to. So if you aspirate uh, autogenous bone marrow and concentrate stem, ce stem cells, you can then apply them to a collagen matrix sponge uh, and then uh, use that. So you really don't have um, much structural support but you may have some bone growth factors and potentially stem cells uh, in a matrix that can sort of hold on to it, you would hope. What about demineralized bone matrix? Well, this is actually cadaver bone, demineralized. 
Um, so what you're really hoping for um, is is really this. This is sort of a way of delivering uh, a physiologic quantity of bone growth factors. Uh, so BMPs, for instance. The thing is, um, you know, they get sterilized. You, you do this acid extraction, and uh, it, it may decrease the availability of the BMP. And the other thing is, um, the bioactivity of these uh, vary significantly from lot to lot and uh, company to company. So what you're getting in one application may vary significantly in uh, uh, bioactivity from the next time you use it. Um, and it, this, this stuff is not that very strictly regulated. It's not a drug. Um, so that's one of the, one of the issues with uh, DBMs. Um, they're available in gels, putties, strips, uh, and essentially, like I said, it's a, it's basically a bone graft that you're uh, what you're trying to do is get all those uh, BMPs and growth factors uh, from by using them. As I mentioned, the growth factor activity can vary from tissue banks and between batches, um, and uh, you know they offer some osteoinductive potential. Uh, but they also have, you know, demineralized bones, so they can act as an osteoconductive agent to a certain degree. What about hydroxyapatite? Well, uh, these are produced from marine coral exoskeletons, and um, they have this porous structure. And if you look at these images, it looks a lot like bone, like a cancellous bone. Uh, you can get these; are commercially available, um, and generally speaking, they're relatively low rate of resorption, take a long time. Tricalcium phosphates are pretty common. Um, they have uh, very good uh, 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 working properties. Um, they have good compressive strength. They uh, can be available in uh, injectable forms as well as in these uh, sort of pre-shaped forms. Um, then you have bone morphogenetic proteins. Uh, these are now, we talked a lot about BMPs, for instance, when you take autograft or when you use um, uh, like a demineralized bone matrix, and those are physiologic doses. Well, you can get super physiologic, very, very high doses by getting commercially available recombinant BMP. So BMP2, for instance, or BMP7. Uh, and these are very powerful bone-forming uh, bone proteins. Uh, one of the relevant studies, at least for orthopedic trauma indication, this is what got the FDA indication, was uh, this uh, study from 2002. And um, uh, these were open tibia fractures treated with uh, BMP2 and placebo in two different doses. And there was a significant um, a reduction in complications uh, and infection and faster healing. So it was fairly compelling evidence Interestingly, though, um, there's more recent data, follow-up to this study, that was also in the jo uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and simply does not get as much press anymore, it seems. Uh, that actually had, they had to pull the plug on the study early because they were having so many complications, and this was in, in reamed tibial nails. They were having so many complications in the study group. So kind of opposite findings and pull the plug on the study and I think you've seen a little bit of um, sort of pendulum swinging a little bit away from using BMPs as much as they were um, maybe 10 years ago. So I would uh, I think that you should uh, check out that uh, that follow-up study as well to sort of uh, round out your your knowledge about this. All right, so uh, I'm going to pause here and we'll talk about um, indications for bone grafts uh, as we wrap up this lecture. Thanks.